The following presentation is part of the Technology and the Corporation Conference Series, sponsored by MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. Well, good afternoon. I'm delighted uh, to be here and to have an opportunity to talk to you about biotechnology manufacturing. Amgen was a pioneer in the field of biotechnology manufacturing, and we remain uh, a leader today uh, in this field. And more generally, I'm pleased to note that the United States is also uh, the leader in biotech manufacturing. In fact, in, in 2009, the last year for which the data are available, there were some 700,000 people uh, employed in the U.S. in the biopharmaceutical industry, directly employed in the biopharmaceutical industry. And these 700,000 people uh, supported uh, another 4 million throughout uh, the national economy. Uh, if you look at the revenues in the sector in the same year, there were about $20 billion of biopharma revenues uh, and, sorry, if you look at the revenues in that same year, 2009, every $20 billion of biopharma revenues through the multiplier effect generated about $40 billion uh, of revenues elsewhere in the economy. And so, uh, in addition, every $20 billion dollars of pharmaceutical revenues were associated with about 250,000 jobs uh, and more than three billion dollars of tax revenues for the federal government. So this is an industry in which the U.S. Uh, has been and remains a leader, uh, but not an industry uh, about which we can be complacent. Uh, this is an industry that is ripe for change, in fact ripe for dramatic change, change which will occur at the intersection of biology chemistry, uh, and engineering. And now more than ever in biotechnology manufacturing, we need leaders like those being produced here in the Global Ops Leadership Program here at MIT. And we need clear-eyed discussions with our government about the things that the government could do and perhaps even should do to help maintain this nation's leading position in biotech manufacturing. Those things include helping to educate the scientists and the engineers that we'll need in order to continue to make advances possible in biotech manufacturing. The need to adapt the regulatory environment in which we operate to keep pace with the changing science. The need to adapt tax policy to reflect the competitive nature that exists internationally as other countries seek to attract biotech manufacturing and the high wage highly educated workforces that go along with biotech manufacturing to their countries. And finally, to, to protect uh, the intellectual property that is created uh, in the highly engineered, highly uh, scientific environment that is biotech manufacturing. And maybe I could start by talking a little bit about Amgen. Uh, Amgen's mission is simple. Our mission is to serve patients. And we try to do that with medicines that address serious illness, and in particular with medicines that include proteins or monoclonal antibodies or peptibodies or other products from the biotechnology arsenal. And you might wonder, in that endeavor, does manufacturing matter? And the answer is that it absolutely does. There's no question about it. In fact, we think manufacturing is a source of competitive advantage at Amgen. I think it has been for some time, and I aim to see that it remains a source of competitive advantage for Amgen. The advantage that we have in manufacturing has enabled us to do what we call every patient every time. That is, to serve every patient that has needed one of our medicines every time that patient needed it. Now, Surprisingly, that's a claim that few of our competitors can match. Making safe, reliable macromolecules like those that we produce is no mean feat. And that's one of the reasons why drug shortages have made front page news, particularly over the course of the last few months. So at a time when sick children, children suffering from leukemia or women suffering ovarian cancer are being told that their medicines are unavailable, manufacturing is not something that we take for granted at Amgen and it's not something that this industry can afford to take for granted. So assuring supply is something that we continue to invest in 
and something that the industry as well needs to continue uh, to invest in. Now let me talk a little bit more specifically about Amgen and the products we make and how long we've been doing it. Amgen was founded in, in 1980 in California, which for the West Coast crowd uh, in the room was the birthplace of biotechnology. There are a few at MIT who might challenge that assertion, a few down the road. In Cambridge, you might challenge the assertion, but we come from California. We are declaring that California was the birthplace of biotechnology. Uh, and so we were one of the first companies to be successful with these new medicines, and in particular, successful in developing the technologies and the processes that were required to manufacture them. We are now uh, the world's largest independent biotechnology company. We employ 17,000 staff, and, and we serve patients directly with our medicines now in more than 50 countries throughout the globe. And I'm, I'm delighted that our medicines are widely used, and in fact, amongst the most widely used uh, in our industry, and we have now served more than 22 million patients who are suffering uh, from grievous illness. Now, when I say biotechnology, what I'm referring to uh, is the process by which medicines are made in living cells. And I couldn't help, when I was watching Diana's presentation and I was uh, seeing the picture of the fellow, I think he was polishing a Chevy Aveo or something as it was coming off the assembly, and I couldn't help but think how different that environment is from that which we operate in. Of course, in our environment, we're never allowed to touch the product. You know, one, of the, one of the really important things is maintaining sterility for our products from start to finish. Uh, and that's also uh, uh, what, what we try to do in operating in living cells is very different from the traditional pharmaceutical industry. So if you think for a moment about the traditional pharmaceuticals, the oral medicines which many of us take, those are the results of chemical processes. Processes that are easy to repeat at industrial scale. You put the ingredients in the right environment at the right time, and you get essentially the same product each time. Products have well-defined structures, products that are easy to characterize, and products that are relatively stable. Now, by contrast, as I said, biotechnology medicines are produced in living cells, and living cells are inherently variable and incredibly tricky to work with, right? Like all of us, incredibly tricky to work with. But if you want to replace a protein that, say, a sick patient is lacking, for example, erythropoietin in dialysis patients, then you have no choice but to make it in a living cell. Or if you want to target a specific receptor on a colon cancer cell, there may be no better way to do it than with an exquisitely sensitive monoclonal antibody. And if that's what you want to do, you have to produce that antibody, again, in a living cell. So biotechnology is about harnessing these living cells, these complex living cells. Biotechnology is about accepting that the unit of production is a cell. And again, it's about accepting that, like all of us, cells are very sensitive to the environment in which they are raised, to the environment in which they develop. So changes in the environment can lead to inappropriate variability in the medicine. That's why so much effort is placed on seeing that the environment in which these cells are raised is very tightly controlled. And the art of biotechnology is selecting the right cell, growing it in the right tightly controlled environment, and coaxing the cell to produce the right molecule and only the right molecule. And if that's not tricky enough, the molecules produced in this fashion are just not inherently stable. And therefore, they require very specific formulation and handling throughout the process and after the process and before the products are used as drugs. So it's a very different process from that which is associated with the traditional oral pharmaceutical uh, uh, business or that which is associated with other uh, manufacturing environments. And both the products that we make and the process, the process that we use to make them, are highly regulated. There used to be a saying, it doesn't apply to the same extent today as it once did in biotechnology, that the process is the product. And so again, what that recognizes is the inherent susceptibility of cells to the process that they're subjected to. And so in this highly regulated environment, both the products and the processes lend themselves to the creation of intellectual property and therefore 
to the need or the importance of protecting that intellectual property. Now, whether you're developing a small molecule oral drug or whether you're developing a biotechnology drug, the process of developing medicines is lengthy and it's expensive. So for example, we recently launched a drug uh, for the treatment of a very rare autoimmune disorder which causes uncontrolled bleeding in those who suffer from it. And it took us about 15 years from the moment we had the biologic insight about this drug to the point where we were able to get it on the market. So lengthy, about 15 years. And if I look at drugs that we've recently brought to market, the cost of bringing those drugs to market is about a billion dollars. And when I look at the industry, at the manufacturers of small oral uh, small molecules, it's about the same. So 15 years and about a billion dollars or more uh, in research and development in order to get a medicine on the market. But biotechnology medicines require an additional layer of expense, which relates to the manufacturing process. So on top of the cost of discovering and developing a drug and having it registered as being safe and effective, biotech medicines also require a sophisticated manufacturing process to make the right amount of protein in a consistent, reliable manner. So there's a set of costs in competing in biotech above and beyond the costs and the expertise required to compete in small molecules. And when you look at the industry today, what you find is about, even for stable, commercialized biologics, the average in the industry shows that about 20% of the time, manufacturers fail to produce a product of reliable quality. So you can imagine what it would be like in Diana's world if, if the auto industry were still operating at a point where 20% uh, of the time, one in five of the cars that came off the end of the assembly line were of insufficient quality to make it to the marketplace. And unfortunately, that's the world that biotech manufacturing still exists in today. In fact, if you look at even some of the most sophisticated and experienced of manufacturers in our industry, what you find is that such things as major viral contaminations have threatened drug supplies or even interrupted drug supplies uh, for ne medicines necessary to treat grievous illnesses. So remember, when we're raising these cells in that environment that enables them to reproduce and produce the protein that we're interested in using as a medicine, we're raising them in an environment that's also very well suited to contaminants like viruses, bacteria, and other microbial uh, challenges. And so again, the, 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 the issue for biotechnology uh, manufacturing has a degree of complexity above and beyond what you see for sure in the small molecule world, and that's reflected in the, uh, in the challenges that we see, and indeed even in some of the drug supply shortages that we see today. One of the reasons that this is true is that we're still, there's still an awful lot to learn about the biology of the cell and what's happening in the cell when it's manufacturing proteins for us. You know, we've been manufacturing proteins at Amgen in things like E. coli. That's a, a cell that we use to make uh, proteins for 30 plus years. We've been manufacturing proteins in the Chinese hamster ovary cell, a mammalian cell that we use to produce complex molecules. Again, and so has the industry for, for decades now. And yet there are still some very fundamental things to be learned about how the cells metabolize nutrients during the process in which we're growing them. And there's still a tremendous amount of science and biology yet to be uh, discovered. And as we discover new insights into these cells that we use as a unit of production in biotechnology manufacturing, we then will have to integrate an understanding of engineering and chemistry in order to harness these insights and produce benefits that we can scale for the industry. So it's, it's again, developing these medicines is expensive, it's risky, and we're still at a very early stage, surprisingly early stage of understanding what actually happens in the cell and how we can control the parameters uh, during the process of manufacturing so that we get more of what we want and less of the problems that we're experiencing today. So again, manufacturing really matters in biotechnology medicines. As I said earlier, there are drug shortages today. In fact, in the US, the FDA is tracking about 120 products which are not available in sufficient supply to meet the needs of patients uh, right now uh, in the US, 120 drugs. 
And there are a variety of reasons why that's true, but two of the uh, issues really stand out. The first is product quality. And I've already alluded to it, but product quality is the biggest challenge and the biggest reason why there are drug supply shortages in the U.S. today. And the second issue is also related, and that is capacity. There's insufficient capacity to make some of the medicines. And I'll talk a little bit later about why that is. But I think what we have to accept is that it's a privilege for those of us who were in this industry to compete in this sector. A privilege to be in an industry which has as its mission the treatment of seriously ill patients. And with that privilege come a set of responsibilities. Prime among which is the responsibility to manufacture products compliantly, to produce quality products compliantly so that those seriously ill patients who need them can rest comfortably knowing that the medicine that they're being given, the medicine that's being injected, is exactly what it's supposed to be. And failure to achieve that compliance in our industry not only results in the kind of patient shortages that you see alluded to on this slide, but also results, uh, results in large fines. Fines uh, in, in the amount of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, are unfortunately um, not common, but have happened in our industry. And the cost of remediating compliance problems in our industry are also very high. So compliance is critical and maintaining safe and effective medicines requires expert staff, advanced science, sophisticated technology, and then adherence to strict standards. Now, as I said before, uh, we have the, uh, the track record of having supplied every patient uh, every time. And uh, we have the benefit of being uh, an industry leader. And an industry leader, uh, as industry leader, we have uh, obviously accumulated considerable knowledge and expertise uh, in the manufacture of biotechnology medicines. We were amongst the first to develop processes for analyzing these molecules that are produced in cells to make sure that we understood what impurities were there or not uh, in large scale manufacturing settings. Uh, and today we still help set the standards for biotechnology manufacturing by sharing our methods and our data uh, with others in the scientific community. The staff that we employ uh, in our manufacturing are highly educated. About 30% of our manufacturing staff have advanced degrees and together they have the necessary expertise uh, and experience and commitment to see that we're supplying quality medicines consistently. Now, being a leader in this industry isn't cheap, unfortunately. In fact, it's very expensive, and we invest considerable capital to maintain our industry leadership. For example, we're investing in capacity, right? The raw capacity to be able to meet the demands for our medicines in the marketplace. We invest a considerable amount uh, of resource in inventory. If you were to compare the inventory that we own, that we hold on our balance sheet uh, with our peers who are just operating in the small molecule business, you would see something dramatically different. Uh, what you find from biotechnology manufacturers is one of the ways that we uh, ensure against the risks to supply interruptions uh, is by holding inventory in distributed locations uh, so that if we have the kind of event that Diana referred to earlier, a tsunami in, in, uh, in Japan or something that interrupts the flow of raw materials to our manufacturing process, we can supply patients with inventory. But that's not free. We tie up a lot of capital in that process, but it's a conscious decision that we make as an industry leader to have that risk uh, uh, mitigated in the form of capital uh, in inventory. And we also invest in process and sophisticated technologies uh, in order to make sure that we can demonstrate to regulators and in turn to patients that the integrity of our products is preserved throughout the so uh, supply chain. Now, if you look at what's happening in our industry, one of the really important things that is going to require us to change the way we make proteins at scale for uses as human therapeutics is globalization. And clearly globalization has new markets opening for biotechnology medicines, new patients seeking to have the cutting edge medicines that biotechnology represents. And with this demand that's growing now across the world come a new set of challenges and responsibilities. A very simple example for you is, is 
relates to the fact that protein therapies are, as I said earlier, not inherently stable. In fact, they're very sensitive to the temperature at which they're stored and transported. So one of the challenges an industry like ours is facing uh, as we globalize is the need to develop a sophisticated cold chain to assure product quality. Most of our products are made, for example, in Rhode Island, just down the road, or made in Colorado, or made in, uh, in, in Puerto Rico. And in order for us to serve patients in, in Africa, we have to establish a cold chain that we can demonstrate to the regulators is maintained so that the integrity of the product that's being used for customers or patients in those markets is every bit as safe and reliably assured as patients using them here in the US. Now, you might think that's not so difficult, but when you consider that that means being able to supply these temperature sensitive products to markets where there isn't reliable electrical service or where refrigeration is not the norm uh, clearly presents a set of challenges for us. One of the ways that we as an industry are going to have to respond to that challenge is by evolving how we manufacture and where we manufacture uh, these proteins. Competition and the pressure to reduce costs, uh, the cost of healthcare, will also drive us to need to think about manufacturing differently, will also drive us to be more innovative in what it is we do when we produce human biologic therapies. And it's important to, to recognize that to the extent we're successful in innovating, to the extent that we're successful in harnessing the science, the biology around making products and cells, we'll also need to make sure that the regulatory environment that oversees our industry evolves appropriately as well. So that as innovation is introduced into manufacturing, the regulatory environment adjusts in time so that we're not delayed or even stalled in the changes that we're trying to make uh, in our manufacturing. And that's tough. You know, right now, uh, regulators are struggling to keep pace with the change in our industry, are struggling uh, to keep pace with the global demands that are being placed uh, on companies like ours. So how have we done it? Uh, as I said, we've been fortunate enough to supply every patient every time. Uh, what is it that has enabled us to do this when other companies uh, have struggled to do that? I think the first thing is that we benefit from having a mature quality management system uh, that has enabled us to be compliant with current good manufacturing practices and assured supply. And we rely on a couple of key principles in our manufacturing process. High reliability performance, something we call defense in depth, which is the integration of people, equipment, uh, and, and you know, people, well-trained people, procedures, and the equipment that they use. So defense in depth is an important piece of what we do. Uh, knowledge management, obviously, also an important piece of what we do, and lean. Uh, we have tried to, and done, I think, a very effective job in bringing the principles of lean, many of which we learned from the automobile industry, to bear on uh, manufacturing biologic medicines. In fact, if you look at the progress that we've made with lean over the last five years, we've had about a 10 uh, or we've been able to reduce abnormal scrap by a, by a factor of about 10, uh, and we have been able to reduce our gross expenses over that five-year period uh, by some 20%. Now, uh, that's impressive, but what we're looking for next is, is something dramatically better than that. And what we're looking to do is to develop a completely new way uh, of manufacturing proteins. Let me just quickly walk you through how the manufacture of proteins has evolved over the last 20 or 30 years. As you see on the first piece of the slide here under the heading of yesterday, when biotechnology medicines were first commercialized, the way in which they were produced, so the way in which these cells that I referred to earlier uh, were, per, were, were um, housed during the manufacturing process were in these small liter or two liter roller bottles, right? And this process resulted in about 0.1 grams of useful protein uh, being produced for every liter of, uh, of uh, uh, process material uh, used in the, uh, in the manufacturing cycle. So 0.1 grams per liter. Uh, over time, we evolved to what you see in the middle here, which is what we call a deep tank uh, method of manufacturing proteins. And we achieved about a tenfold as an industry, about a tenfold improvement uh, in the amount of protein that we generate through the manufacturing process. Uh, so we went from about 0.1 to something in the order of one to two, three, four. Uh, grams per liter in the manufacturing uh, of proteins. And what we're trying to do tomorrow is something very different. One of the problems that the first two technologies have is that they're capital intensive. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars 
to build. They require very long lead times. They operate with a high fixed cost burden. They're not very flexible. We can't move different products in and out of them. So they actually don't serve the needs of the current marketplace very well. And what we see next is something that's disruptively different. We're calling it, uh, at Amgen, we call it the manufacturing of the future. But what it reflects is our desire to develop technologies that will dramatically increase our productivity, uh, dramatically Im improve our yields, reduce our scale and footprint. Uh, and we're looking for there to be gains as well in the speed with which we can go from identifying a molecule in the lab to having the molecule available in the marketplace for, for sick patients. So we believe that we are on the cusp of a major change in how we manufacture proteins uh, at Amgen, a major change that will enable us to uh, operate uh, and manufacture a wider range of products and manufacture them at different scales so that we'll be able to produce products for which the demand is relatively small in terms of quantity and, and in addition be able to supply products for which the demand is very high. Let me give you an example of this. You think about, again, our, one of the products around which Amgen was founded, erythropoietin. I, I mentioned it earlier. That's a, uh, a protein which enables all of us to make red blood cells. Patients who are suffering from kidney failure and, and patients who are being dialyzed no longer produce enough of this protein on their own to be able to uh, continue to, to make red blood cells. So they either require transfusions or they need a medicine like ours in order to enable their body to keep making red blood cells. Now, we make about uh, less than 10 pounds of this material will supply the 300 plus thousand patients that are on dialysis in the US. So don't need a lot of that material. On the other hand, we make a medicine called Enbrel, which is a product that treats patients who are suffering from, for example, debilitating rheumatoid arthritis. And we need tons of that material in order to supply the market in the US alone uh, for that product. And so uh, manufacturing of the future is a technology that we believe will enable us to make products in large quantity where we need to, but also enable us to make those products for which we don't need at the end of the day, uh, a large volume of product in order to meet the needs of the patients. So a technology that will enable us to be much more diverse, much more adaptive, moving in and out of different products more quickly, more responsive. Uh, in other words, enable us to meet market demand so we don't find, as some of our competitors have, that if suddenly there's good data on a, on a, clinic, on a molecule, uh, we see patients responding well, for example, to a cancer drug. We need to know that we'll be able to make enough of it so we can supply every cancer patient every time they need one of our medicines. The technologies we're investing in, we think will enable us to do that. And we think they will be cost effective uh, uh, to a scale that is what, uh, well beyond what we've achieved uh, with the uh, core technologies that we've been operating over the course of the last decade. So the next generation getting there won't be easy. That's one of the challenges that those who are going to seek to follow us in this area will discover. The investment will be considerable, both in terms of people, uh, uh, money, other resources, and we're prepared to make those investments. We're making them now as, as fast uh, and as prudently as we can, but the investments to go from where we are today to where we want to go are going to be considerable. The challenge from a, regulate, a regulatory standpoint will also be considerable. We're talking about using technologies and doing things differently from how it's been done before. And so we, together with the regulators, will have to make sure that an appropriate framework is developed in order to assure uh, that our products are being manufactured and getting to patients uh, in an appropriate way. We recognize that perhaps once again, we will be leading regulators to, to think differently about how uh, we manufacture proteins for human therapeutics. And then finally, I'd note that, that what we're doing brings technology to the heart of manufacturing. You know, the idea that you could have innovation or technology separate from manufacturing just will not work in where we're going uh, with manufacturing in the future at Amgen. So technology and innovation will be at the heart uh, of our manufacturing uh, enterprise. You know, I'd, I'd note, as I said earlier, that U.S. is a leader today uh, in manufacturing uh, biologic products. Uh, we have all the tools we need here in the U.S. to develop this new set of technologies that I'm referring to. Uh, and we have the strong framework for IP protection. We have the right scientists, the right engineers, the right suppliers uh, in the U.S. And so I'm hopeful uh, that the U.S. will continue to be a leader as this new technology is adapted uh, at Amgen uh, and beyond as well. 
Continuous improvement has to happen in biologic manufacturing. I talked earlier about the fact that 20% uh, failure rate just isn't sustainable uh, for our industry. So we've got to get to something much closer uh, to a zero defect environment. We've got to get as an industry to a place where we can make products to match demand. Uh, we've got to be faster and more responsive to the needs of our patients and customers. And we, need, we have to accept uh, that, that cost pressures mean we've got to be able to take more and more cost and waste out of the manufacture of biologic medicines. And again, I think that means for Amgen and for the industry uh, that the, the people that are engaged in this uh, activity are going to have to work in a collaborative, cross-functional way to an even greater extent than they did uh, in the early days of uh, the biotechnology industry. Uh, I'd like to end where I started, which is to say our mission is uh, to serve patients. And our mission in particular is to serve patients with serious illness wherever they reside. And disease knows no boundaries, and we want to be able to serve patients with our medicines wherever they are, whenever uh, they meet, they need them. And to meet these challenges, again, we believe we're going to have to make dramatic change in how we make proteins at Amgen. And you know, we've been in business now about 32 years, and I think we're on the cusp of our third major change in how it is that biologics are made. Uh, and so what I would say, particularly to the students in the audience, is this is a very exciting time to be studying biology or engineering or chemistry. Uh, and we look forward to working with more and more of you to commercialize this on a scale that will really make a difference for the patients who are counting on us. So thank you very much. <laughs>